Welcome everybody to Dat Poker Podcast. Daniel, Adam, Terrence, DUT. Poker Podcast episode 142. Uh, this here podcast presented by Daniel Legrandu's masterclass of PokerMasterclass.com. Head on over there. Check out the masterclass that Daniel and Phil Ivey's also done one too. So uh, two for the price of one if you jump on and get the full full membership there at MasterClass.com. Uh, I'm your host, Dave Schwartz, alongside producer extraordinaire Roscoe P. Coltrane. What's up, guys? And T. Chan, T. in Kelowna, how are you, sir? I'm doing great. I like how you went extraordinaire and then Ross immediately goofed on the uh, <laughs> on, on the drop. That was the extraordinaire is a bit of a <laughs> yeah award winning. <laughs> by, by the way, you know, I swear I'm one day I'm going to stop reading the YouTube comments, but every week somebody's like. How come Ross is only on the show for five seconds? Because he's the fucking producer. He doesn't. doesn't I it's mean, you welcome to contribute whenever he yeah. wants to, but he <laughs> he makes this thing all run, makes us all sound good. Just you know, does edits when somebody fucks up, e.g., him just now. <laughs> this is what he does. You know, the rest of us talk. It's kind of like the Matt Damon Jimmy Kimmel thing, right? Like you know, he's he's on board, but doesn't really speak. And and Daniel Legrand in Las Vegas, who does speak, Daniel, how are you? I'm good. I was thinking five seconds might be a little much, you know, right. going <laughs> forward. I don't know if we can fade it. Um, no, I just woke up. Yeah, I had a little frog in my throat, whatever. Took a little nap after watching a little bit of the sports. Pretty pretty fun time of year with, you know, NBA, NHL playoffs gone. So, yeah. Uh, doing that, literally mm-hmm. thumbs, listening to spaces for way too many hours and uh, gearing yeah. up the theory. It's been quiet yeah. in spaces the last few days. I haven't. I, I don't think I've listened to any spaces that had like four thousand listeners and stuff like that. At, ever since eight that just ran, that was I think okay. twenty four hours. Wow! Like who, was, it, who it, ran that one? Well, this guy he he says he calls himself the orbiter. He said he keeps saying he's really good at it, great at it. Like every time you sign in, he's like, "Hi, I'm Eden Rocks, and I'm really good at this." <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know if it's a bit or not, but he uh, he hosts a bunch of them and he does it like for. I don't know. It's like 18 hours, 24 hours, some crazy shit like that. It's back at, it's like the days of uh, Black Friday. Remember when uh, Quad Jacks ran for uh, 36 hours. So let's jump into that. Twitter spaces, uh, poker has taken over the poker world for the last uh, week, 10 days. There's been all kinds of activity. Daniel, I know you've been involved in a lot of them. Um, It's cathartic, right? It's this interesting sort of uh, medium that uh, you can come together with on Twitter and people can uh, sign in, listen, and and contribute. And then the way it's set up is really cool. I think uh, it's been a lot of fun. And and you know, I don't know if we want to run through all the different uh, drama and different things that have happened on Twitter Spaces and poker in the poker world in the last ten days. But just to touch on it, I think quickly, um, uh, Doug Polk was in the middle of it with uh, uh, Dankness was hosting one, and Charlie Carroll came in. And uh, Doug had been going after Charlie for quite some time about uh, a tweet that Charlie made. Uh, some time ago discussing Charlie's a victim of um, sexual assault when he was a young uh, boy and uh, he you know tweeted that maybe a way for or I'm not can't remember exactly how he phrased it but have empathy for child molesters if you want to um, decrease the amount of uh, children that are molested and it's you know a, I guess a somewhat controversial take but Doug kind of latched onto that and uh, in the way that Doug does sometimes he uh he focused on that and sort of took shots at Charlie quite often, which were quite hurtful to Charlie for a long time. And um, it seemed quite... Uh, I think you're underselling shots, right? Took shots is one thing, but like literally framing them as a p- pro-pedophile, right? Like, yeah. I get, you know, you're, I mean, shots is fair, but it's like, it feels way more like bigger right. than that. Like to literally frame the guy in a video that, you know, almost a million people saw and now believe, and now Charlie has Charlie who is the victim of being abused by his grandfather, having to say, no, I am not a pedophile, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just felt like there was, the no, no. of that was bigger than just a shot. And I think maybe the reason that I phrase it that way is because, and we'll get to it quickly, I guess, but Doug came on and apologized. You know, you can discuss, he apologized for how we uh, handled this situation, how we talked to Charlie during that Twitter spaces. Um, not that that absolves him of, of what he said and what he did in the past by any stretch. Uh, but it's nice to see him, and I think you—you uh, you know, Doug had some experiences on on Twitter Spaces where he, um, you know, talked about some of the stuff that he went through as a kid, and it seems like let's let's let's, let's go through that because I was actually on this whole space. Sure. And I don't know if you still think so. So basically, you know, this was one that Doug actually decided to come out with because this was after Phil Galfon wrote that somewhat scathing right. piece, you know, 
the way that he perceived Doug in the community, right? So Doug wanted to open up the floor and I started with him, right? And I felt like we were really getting somewhere. You know, I think we did. We opened up about, because we really want to get to the crux of like, why do you do what you do? Because like, I always see him as a sensitive guy and that can be both good and bad, right? And the bad comes from like, you know, when you feel attacked, you come back and fight full force. So we got to a place where he shared some of the stories about him, you know, being bullied as a kid and deciding one day he'll never let that happen when he's an adult. And, you know, he fights hard and fights with fire. So that was my conversation with him. It went pretty well. Then he had Fernando on, who they had a dispute um, over upswing stuff. And through the space, they were able to come to sort of like a, not would say kumbaya moment, but to sort of an acknowledgement of like, okay. And this is sort of what I was going to touch on with Twitter space specifically is, Unlike Twitter, where you put out 140 characters and you don't get the context, you don't actually have to speak to the person, they're often, the tone is so much more vicious. But when we actually speak, kind of like a throwback to old radio talk shows, which is essentially what these are, people are more willing to like willing to listen and understand. So for, I, I felt like they got to a good place. Then, of course, Berkey came on and, you know, then it sort of derailed itself. And at the very end, Phil Galfon came on. And, um, yeah, I sort of felt, I would say felt sorry for Phil, but... It, he wasn't prepared for that. You know, right after the Berkey stuff, like Doug was in, you know, aggro mode. And like Doug on the spot in an environment like that is going to be quick. He's going to come at you with sort of the arguments. Well, and Doug's also been thinking about everything you want to say. As he's reading this article, he's thinking point by point, wrong, wrong, wrong. Like that's how I'll tackle this. Gelfon came on. He spent like an hour just trying to figure out. You had to fucking call him on the phone and he had no idea even how to get on a Twitter space. And so he's just going in there being like, this is what I wrote. Whereas Doug, you know, he's, he's got his shields already. He's got, well, you know, he's got guards posted at the gates with the, with the shotguns. Well, what's and, interesting, and, it's, I, and I kept telling Doug this, it, said, it sounds like you were trying to deflect. Because what he focused on about the piece was, you said, you wrote that I will attack Berkey um, any chance I get. Right? And he's like, by definition, oh, he says, whenever, whenever, and whenever. He says, by definition, not whenever and whenever. Right. So like, that's what you're arguing over, like the phrasing of the word. Right. Or Doug's, you know, him saying that like Doug will attack any. Right. So Doug pushed back on the semantics because obviously when you say someone will attack you whenever, whenever they sleep. So by definition, that can't be true. So what Doug does a lot. Right. And he did this in this debate. and not is he'll focus on a, on a semantical case that he could, quote unquote, win that has nothing to do with the actual merit of the piece or like the, the gist of the piece. Right. One of the things that he did too as a tactic was. He would say to Phil things like, why did you choose to misconstrue me and, you know, shape my character in such a way that was, was wrong? And Phil's like, I don't believe that I did, right? You know, I don't, I don't believe that I did do that. But see, like when you phrase the question like that, it's like if I said to you, Terrence, I'm like, so Terrence, like, why are you like really bad at this? Is it because of this or that? And you're like, but I don't, I don't think I'm bad at it. <laughs> like, then he went on to uh, sort of, you know, say that he thought it was important to know that Phil also owned a training site, right? And he's a competitor. And Phil Galfon, I actually kind of like this, Brian. He said, why is that important? Just simply that, right? Because the question is like, so why are you bringing it up, right? Because, you know what, in fairness, right? If you have two competitors who are in competing business, whether it's Coke and Pepsi, you know, and one slanders the other or attacks the other, you could assume, you know, there's, pro there's potentially something there. But Phil Galfon has been in the industry for 20 plus years. His peers respect him. We take him at his word. If he said he did this, really, I wouldn't say against his will, but this was really hard for him. I know this for a fact. He did not want to do this, but he genuinely, like he wrote the piece, said, you know, is just being nice enough or should I speak out? He, to his credit, he watched, you know, Charlie step up. He watched Justin Bonneville step up and thought, maybe it's my turn too, right? So he entered the arena with the piece. Obviously, Doug has every right to not like the piece, right? People write stuff about you. It's not glowing. You know, you have every right to push back in that regard. But overall, I felt like, you know, then Doug got really upset and sort of shut it off. But I think going back to something earlier with the Charlie thing, a lot of people were pushing back on apology because he released like a 50 second video on Twitter, right? Which isn't his like main base, you know, it's sort of like a, you know, it's a hit and it's gone, right? The real damage was done on YouTube, right? Where like, you know, whatever, 8,000, 800,000 player people saw it. To Doug's credit, he did take down the videos, any videos where he did sort of allude to Charlie being pro-pedophile and all this kind of stuff. But essentially what we got to as a community is sort of, you know, recognizing the pattern and showing Doug, this is your pattern. You have a beef with somebody, you you attack them personally. And, you know, he's apologized for some of that, um, to his credit again, like I said. 
And he did say that, you know, he wants to tone down on some of the personal attacks. So the point being is these Twitter spaces do get somewhere, like, because we can have that interaction. I really think that we should, uh, maybe once a week or something, you know, you know, us together, we can, you know, sort of evolve the show a little bit too sometimes where we open it up to fans of the show, whatnot, so they can chime in and, you know, have a little bit of a back and forth with them and, and any other cool guests we might bring on. Absolutely. And there was an incredible moment. Um, you know, you didn't even really bring it up yet, but an incredible moment between you two um, on Doug's space, which I, I think, you know, hit everybody in the, in the fields pretty hard. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll lead it up by, by sort of saying like, you guys are all trying to have an intervention with Doug, as you mentioned, saying, you know, this is, this is a, this is a pattern with you. This is a thing that people do. And this is after that, the, that apology was issued to Charlie Carroll, but also after Doug and Charlie, you know, had this long Twitter space where they kind of went after each other for an hour and Doug didn't seem to be getting the point. And Ross, you've got that audio. Could you play it for us? Like, like children when anymore. someone crosses you or when someone doesn't like you or someone comes at you with like, cause you know, how you say you can take it. You know, Rob Young was saying that it's like you take it, but you take it cause you can give it back a thousand times worse. Right. You know, and you know that, right. So it puts you in a, in, in a kind of position where, you know, that sort of sensitivity of, I think my personal opinion, wanting to be liked when you're not, or when, when I, when someone pushes back against you, it brings out like the worst parts of who you are when you try to tear somebody down. And that's not who you are. I don't think that's not the entirety of you. I, I don't think I've seen, you know, yeah. you know, we've had good discussions in the last year, you know, my wife trying out your products and loving them and, you know, all these kind of positive things, you know, and some stories from Len Ashby and other people saying good things about you. It's when that, when that, when your ego is pierced or whatever it is, that's when you go into this attack mode and, you know, looking deeper into that specific aspect of your persona and your personality, I think, and again, I'm not trying to be a psychologist here, but like, I really think you get a lot of value out of looking at like, man, why do I, why do I do that? You know? Yeah, I think I think that that's that's pretty accurate. I, I debated talking about this today in my video I made, but I, I didn't really want to make it long winded and kind of just psychoanalytical about myself and, and my upbringing and stuff. But I think this is probably a, a reasonable spot to, to talk about it. So, I mean, when people ask me like where I'm from, I I never really lived anywhere specifically. Um, I moved around constantly. I always was at new schools. Uh, I went to like. I don't know, 10, 12, 15 schools or something. I don't even know the number. It was just so many. I, ideas where I'd go school to school to school. And so I, I never really had any consistent friends growing up. Um, I was constantly thrown into new areas and new places. And, and I was always just kind of the fat kid that got picked on everywhere that I went just along the way. Um, so I, I, I had to get used to like, you're in a new environment. You're going to get made fun of. You're going to get picked on. You're going to get attacked. And like, I was too weak to be able to defend myself because... I had no friends and, uh, you know, I was, I was like the weak kid, you know, I was like the new kid. I was an easy target. So my whole life, I just got relentlessly picked on. And, uh, you know, I never, I didn't date until much later. And I struggled to really have friends in any capacity. I mean, I had a few friends along the way for sure. Um, but, you know, I would just, I remember vowing to myself, like, as we like couldn't afford to live in, in, in different places that we moved to, like, you know, one day, like, we're paycheck to paycheck, can't eat, I'm getting picked on, we're moving around. Like, when I'm older, like, I will defend myself. And, uh, you know, I, I will make sure that I'm not going to be in this position and my family won't be in this position. And, um, like, I, I'm weak now, but I will beat everyone to, and do what I have to do to, to not be weak when I'm an adult. And that's really kind of, like, what drove me through poker was this, like, un <clears throat> unnerving, never-ending feeling of, like, the reason that I was weak <clears throat> when I was a kid, um, I'm never going to let that happen to me again. And and just every night I would play as long as I, it took and study as long as it took. And every opponent I played, I would dig deep and I would figure out how to beat them and make sure that I won. And to a point where I built something for myself, you know, from nothing um, to protect myself, to show that I could do it and and to, to not be to not be in that position where I'm just an easy target because I'm the, the new fat kid. Yeah, that's really powerful, right? And that's that's uh, it's the power of this medium. Like, he's um, open to discussing his past. He's open to realizing why he does the things that he does, and and that was a really cool moment. I agree. We with learned that. so much about him and the things he's done in that moment that you you can't help 
but have empathy in that moment. You know, up until that point, you just saw him as this person who makes attack dog videos on people and and edits them in a very, you know, a lot of people would say really unethical way to make people look worse, to take things out of context uh, and do it for clicks and, you know, do it. And, and now you sort of see where that where a lot of that comes from, where that trauma is. I don't want to be bullied anymore. I'm not that kid anymore. I'm going to be stronger. And to some extent, there is a, a process with bullying. And a lot of people have accused what Doug has done of being bullying. And I think it abs- I think in many ways that's the right word. But you you see the bully become the bully, you know. It's insecurity, in right? And you had a great moment with him there. And I want to give you props there, Daniel, for yeah. for really humanizing him. And you know, you you sort of you felt like something. I, I you know, I don't, I don't want to be in your head now, but I, it seemed to me like you you sort of felt something was there, but you weren't quite sure what it was. And then, and then that, that came pouring out and it was, it was a hell of a moment. Let's, let's be honest, right? Obviously, you know, anybody, as you get older, you're like, you could have assumed, right? That anyone that's sort of a bully, there's a reason for it, whether it's their dad who beat them or whether they, you know, were bullied themselves or something like that. There was the source there. So like, that was already kind of assumed that my goal with, you know, having this Twitter space with him wasn't to pile on him, was generally to get him to see, but ultimately this, that when you're doing that, when you're in those moments, which many consider, you know, the ugliest burden of yourself. That's just that little boy yelling and screaming, you're not going to, you're not going to get me. I will get you. And right. I obviously, you know, being the OG, you know, teardown video of his, you know, he spent several years doing everything he could. And, you know, he's apologized, like I said, we asked it, but, you know, he, uh, you know, he systematically was doing that. And I, and if you listen to the entirety of the thing, maybe I'll release it on my channel or whatever, but we essentially got to, um, kind of where that started and how I could have, like, as an older statesman of the game, right, already was, you know, established. And, um, you know, when he starts his video, essentially he's punching up, right? And it, ultimately I told him, well, you're no longer punching up against anyone and, you know, you're always punching down. But looking back, I sort of told him, I said, you know, early on you did some things I didn't like and I sort of wagged my finger at you, right? But uh, deep down, I think you just wanted me to like you and respect you. And I didn't. And I didn't give you the time of day. I didn't give you the guidance. I didn't, you know, support you. Instead, I turned my back on this kid because, you know, it started with the Jason Mercier thing and calling him a bad rag. You know, they started off kind of like hot in that regard. Um, and then I think, you know, in su- to some degree, he reverted back to that feeling he had and was like, I'm just going to destroy this guy. Right. So then you're going to see my car in a handicapped spot during the World Series. Like I parked there every day. You know, you're going to you're going to see billboards and say more rake is better, you know, on top of the Rio and all these kind of things. And like, you know, he went full out. And the, the issue is, that formula works, right? Because it was effective in sort of besmirching me to a certain degree. And the problem is we see it repeated with Alec Torelli, another one who literally had a chip behind his stack, right? And, you know, there was a brouhaha, but whether he, like he was angling, it was clearly like, in my opinion, not, but he just ruins like his business, his character, just, you know, and again, seeing that pattern develop, like what we wanted to do or the goal for me with the space was to, to break the pattern so that, you know, when he does these videos, still be funny, make jokes, all those kind of things, but make sure whoever the butt of the joke is, they're in on the joke, right? Rather than, you know, potentially hurting their livelihood or their, you know, their their personal life in a way. Yeah, it's interesting, right? I think it's a, a mix of two things. First off, what we're talking about with his, with his background, but Doug also realized pretty quickly that punching up, to, as you put it, Daniel, against you, and to this, remember, you know, you're talking about more rake is better or whatever, it's it's a lot different from what happened with Charlie, right? I mean, that's it, it's sort of a much smaller scale than than you know uh, really traumatizing for somebody like Charlie, right? Like you're in a position where it's yeah, it sucks to have a billboard and and but it's not quite the same kind of damage as far as emotional and and that kind of. I, stuff. I mean, Charlie said like well, you ruined my life. Yeah, like, these are words. Dan, yeah. Daniel would never say this billboard ruined my life. Right, it exactly. Annoyed yeah. him maybe at the most. Well, I think what I'm trying to say is that Doug realized pretty quickly that that would get him traffic, that would get him credibility, that would get him to, you know, um, you punching up is 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 by definition um, becoming more uh, visible in the poker space, and whatever you know rewards come from that, Doug realized that it was a positive thing for his business. So it seemed like it was a mix because he's that's a really smart yeah. guy. Obviously, Doug's a very here's the thing though, right? You're touching on something that's really important because he's very analytically driven, right? And I started yeah. to touch on this with him too, which I thought was an important point to make in that like he judges the success or failure of a video based on how many people see it, right? 
So the analogy I would use is let's say you're a big time actor. You can just do like superhero movies where you make 10 million, right? Even though that's not your passion. Or you can like do an indie film, you know, where it's some of your best work and it was for you, right? And he thinks, you know, doing that is the failure, whereas the big blockbuster movies are the success. So once he dives into the analytics and sees using my name in videos, you know, and sort of attack style videos and things like that, that works, right? Now you have, like, like I said, a formula that you push forward with other people. And I think the issue comes is that, well, especially for someone like in my shoes at the time, like, you know, I had people saying, do this, do that. And I was like, I didn't want to get in the mud because essentially I'd be punching down. I didn't want to, because the thing is, I believe like when you get into those pissing matches, nobody comes out clean and he didn't have anything to lose, right? Because he was just making an image himself where I sort of, you know, I didn't, I didn't, you know, want to get into the mud, if you will. So it was kind of, it's kind of an un, un um, you know, it's kind of, he's finally feeling some of it. And I thought it was a little bit cute at the end. He's, you know, at the very end of his thing, he said, guys, it's been a really hard few days. And I wanted to say, it's probably been a hard couple of years for Charlie and others, you know, for victims. Not to say that you're not feeling it. And this is the other thing, you know, you sort of touched on it. It's not a contest of like who was hurt most, right? The bottom line is, you know, you're hurting people in different ways and you're doing it maliciously. And ultimately what I call them is like, you're so talented. You're so good at this stuff. You don't need to do that anymore. Like you just don't, you can choose now. And he's like, no, you don't get to choose. And I said, you do. Cause he believes that like, you can't, you can't choose what people like. You can't choose what people buy, but you can choose the content that you put out. And if you love it, you know, there's supposed to be some joy in the, um, creativity, creative aspect rather than, you know, just how many people watch it. Cause if you're doing it only based on how you know, other people watching it, ultimately you'll never be satisfied because whatever numbers you get, you'll continue to want. And I pardon the phrase more. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's true. No, that whole uh, that whole hour or however long it was that you did, that's that's great listening and it's great. And, you know, I, I want to point out that Doug Shields, to, to some extent, despite his vulnerability, sort of in that three minute clip that we played, it's still there. His shields were up the next very nice ne- next night uh, when he was talking to Galfond, when he was talking to Berkey. It, they're still there and you don't overcome a childhood of trauma in just, you know, an, a couple hours of talking to people. But Hopefully he finds, you know, some peace going forward and, and decides that, you know, maybe, maybe this isn't what he has to do. Maybe his life's calling isn't just taking everybody down a notch. And um, but yeah, I mean, it was, there was, there was, I, I think you said it best right off the top, which is that when we, when we have 280 characters, we're not going to be able to express the nuance. We're not going to have real conversations with people. I mean, sometimes you do. But the, it's different from when you're actually hearing somebody's voice on the other end or talking to somebody in person and, and really getting the way they feel. And it took Doug that lengthy conversation with Charlie to realize, hey, this is a person I've genuinely hurt. This is a person that I've hurt through my actions uh, and that I've that you know I've I've caused great harm to. And you know, at, at least he's he's making steps towards doing the right thing with regards to that. And you know what? We're only spending this much time talking about Doug because. I think, well, personally, at least, um, I've known Doug for quite some time, not been, you know, close friends with him or anything, but he was on our podcast ages ago and I've had interaction with him, and, um, he's been in the studio and, and spent some time with us. And I always really liked Doug. I always thought he was a, a, a nice kid and, um, you know, obviously very good at poker and well-spoken and, you know, back then quite humble and, and uh personal guy and and you know i know daniel you've had your run-ins with him but um you know i don't i think if we didn't really give a shit we wouldn't have spent whatever we spent half an hour talking about it right well here's the thing though like the point is you know and this is something i wanted to end with is he's a very powerful figure in the vocal world his content is great he's number one in space right so winning him over to think about the greater good for all is like a real win but in addition to that i want to make sure people realize because this really upset me you know, Phil Galfin wrote that piece from the heart. He spent 12 hours doing it. He wrote what he thought was like a fair and balanced piece in terms of how he really believes it. I understand Doug doesn't like it, but people questioning Phil Galfin's motives is so ridiculous. Are there, are there really that many people questioning? Are, I don't think there are that many people. I, was, Doug, I, I, I found the prime minister, right? Doug says, look, we're the two biggest training sites. This yeah, is- but yeah, but obviously he's going to have that point of view. And, well, and but here's supposed, the thing, it's effective, circle. right? Because this is the thing, right? So- Doug, and this is, you know, he's, he's, he should be in politics. He said he's going to do this because this is what he does. He's diverted, right? Instead of the conversation being about the bullying and his character and stuff like that, now the conversation, the narrative people are talking about is Phil Galfon's motives for why he wrote the piece, right? I take Phil at his word. All of his peers would take him at his word. But now that's the question. So Phil, you know, I don't think he even realized that anyone would question 
in mo- his motors. Because if you're a random person who knows nothing and you hear that, you know, the, the, the CEO of Pepsi was just wrote a skating piece about the CEO of Coke. People can, would make, if you don't know either party, you'd make the assumption that there's something to this, right? But data, track record, and, you know, like he's never done this before to anyone ever. He's like avoided controversy like the plague, right? He's never, uh, and he's had opportunities, right? He could have done this, you know, you know, plenty of times. So when you look at that, you have to give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that they're, you know, that they're, you know, you take them at their word. And that's the thing, like you can't judge based on a bunch of people that don't know the people, but in the community, you know, like if you look at the 50, the 100, 200 people in this community, to a man or woman, they would say that like, you know, Phil Galfon's word is impeccable. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Excellent point to end on. I do want to quickly just say before, you know, it's just bash dog all the time. Um, I know we did talk about it, but fantastic that he um, was vulnerable and open and understanding of why, you know, some people would have some issues with him and um, looking forward to, you know, the, not new and improved, but uh, Doug's different take on how he approaches um, controversies in the poker world. And he may, maybe doesn't go after people personally as much as sort of what the what the issue one, is. One last thing. I know that we wanted to finish and move on, but there's one other thing that I really found really powerful about the spaces and all this kind of stuff is because he's, you know, a powerful force and nobody wants to be next, right? Nobody wants to like be the next one who's attacked by Doug. This was very Me Too-ish in so many ways where one person stepped forward, another person was brave enough to step forward with their stories of feelings and all this sort of stuff. So like hopefully going forward, you know, rather than, you know, Charlie, for example, like, you know, mentioned that, you know, nobody stood for him when this was going on. I didn't even know about it at the time, but, um, you know, they were just sort of watched and as somebody was getting smeared, same with Alec Torelli and, and the like. So hopefully going forward, you know, if Doug or anybody else is like, you know, out of line that, you know, we hold them accountable and we speak out as a community and we say, no, no, you know, that, that doesn't fly. Yeah. I wanted to say that <clears throat> I'll put the link to the space in the, in the comments and, uh, with the timestamp. I couldn't, can't figure out how to download it or anything to put okay. it in the- I box. have it available too. Christian has it. You can just get the entire bit from him from one okay. to two or nine. Cause I was going to release a video about it and I just changed my mind. Okay. And quickly, big props to Charlie for coming forward and, you know, talking about how her he was too. Talk about Doug. Let's talk about Charlie quickly. Um, and, you know, looking at and saying to Doug, I love you unconditionally. So it's all good. Like I've, I'm past it. Um, and he's just got that capability. And that really kind of resonated with me, what Charlie said, because, you know, he's talking about having empathy. Maybe that's a way to reduce child molestation is having empathy for these people. And it's also looking at somebody who's traumatized him uh, to some degree and saying, I love you unconditionally. And being having his heart open like that um, is really inspiring, I think, for for a way to, you know, go about your life, right? No, uh, agreed. I, that's what I found just from listening to Charlie in a couple of spaces earlier, you know, what he said in his tweet is exactly what experts in the field would say in order to reduce the number of traumatic uh, events for children in this, in this environment or like with, with this issue, you know, he's right, you know, and it's not just empathy for the, you know, the perpetrator. It's, it's actually uh, for, for the person who goes through the tra- trauma for them to heal, for Charlie to heal learning to have empathy for that person is awful and as twisted as that sounds like, you know, which it's crazy to think like, why would you ever have, you know, empathy for that? But in, in terms of healing, it sort of allowed him to take his power back. He went very deep into explaining, you know, that process and whatnot. So what he said, and of course, again, Twitter isn't nuanced enough, right? You put a tweet out, people read that and they go, what, what are you talking about? You, you're saying we should be happy for the for pedophiles? No, that's not what he said. But again, you know, you have to also be responsible for anything you said. And even Charlie admitted, he's like, yeah, I would have worded it differently if I could do it now. But, you know, it doesn't mean because I put this tweet out that it's just so hurtful for somebody who actually is the victim, you know, by their grandfather of such a pain and sack, as well as his wife, who was abused as a child, to be like now, you know, painted as a pedophile himself. Like that's, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if you can get more than that. That's bad. Brutal. Uh, okay, let's move on to some poker. Uh, that's what this show is about. Let's talk to poker. Um, the return of the high stakes duel happened over on Poker Go, and Daniel, you were intimately involved. But this isn't the first high stakes duel that didn't include Phil Helmet, right? Because uh, Phil's no longer playing. Um, but you took on Eric Person. In a, is it Person? Have we decided if it's Person or Person? Have we decided that yet? Person, I think it's Person. Yeah, Person. Okay, you took on Eric Person 
in a $50,000 heads up challenge. This is the first stage. Uh, we're back to the first stage and um, you were victorious. You came out great. Uh, I, I got a big take out of the, because uh, Eric, of course, is this guy who's uh, in the gym all the time, putting on muscle. You put on the muscle suit, came out and had fun with it. To your point earlier, you were saying, you know, it's fun to have fun with these things as long as the person's in on the joke, right? And that's very similar to this situation where, you know, I think Eric probably took it in the right way. I don't know if you talked to him beforehand or told him you were going to do it, but uh, he's open to that kind of the Maverick Nation, right? Like, you know, uh, uh, got a kick out of that. That was that was awesome. I, I don't know that many people in the world who have been offended by a but that that spend all the time in the gym getting yoked. And then some skinny dude shows up with a muscle shirt, just pretend to be like, look at me, I'm a muscle guy. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's happened. Yeah. That yeah, but you have a good point. Obviously, you know, first, I obviously, you know, the, the, the production crew knew it. They loved the idea. I mean, I found these things online. Ross, if you can find a, you know, a picture with the fingers up, you know, in the shirt and stuff like that, and you can put it up there for the viewers to see for those that didn't. And yeah, you know, I thought about it. Obviously, $50,000 is not, you know, an astronomical amount of money for him or I, but I, you know, what's a way we can have some like positive fun. And he laughed throughout the thing. And I think the only person offended or bothered by it is Norman Chad, who tweeted. Oh, Norman, he was no, bad. he wasn't. Yeah. Was it? You're well, kidding. He's like lost cause and sold for You're a kid, Nor. Oh. What did he say? He said something about like, cause he thinks, you know, something about flipping the bird and, you know, you go Dnex for amp aping in. And I had to look up what the word aping meant and whatever, but like the guy's nonstop. I mean, I don't know. He's just on one and he's been on one for years and, I don't know. <laughs> I, I haven't blocked on Twitter. Wow, he did. Yeah. He did. I, I, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was like, he's literally the only person I know that didn't think it was funny or like, you know, understood the joke and sort of turning what was like sort of a weird and, you know, issue with Phil Hellmuth into something just funny, right? That everyone can laugh at except him because, you know, yeah, because he's, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so you end up taking down the match. I think you, uh, <laughs> that's awesome. That was to Phil, right? That's when he played Phil. You broke out the big fingers. That's that's funny. Yeah. Uh, you took him down uh, pretty easily. I, I, you know, I think you know he had aces a couple of times. You flopped a set on him when he had the open ender. Um, not that that you know negates anything. I'm sure um, you know he doesn't have near the experience that you do playing heads up. Uh, no limit hold him. So uh, I, you know, I think you're probably a pretty big favorite to start. But Thanks to Doug Polk. Throwback. Thanks, Doug Polk. Uh, so, thoughts on the match, Daniel? Uh, you know, uh, obviously, maybe you ran pretty good, but um, what do you think uh, of Eric's game? Okay, so yeah, so fun. And I've spoken to Eric since, you know, and I sort of since we're not playing a rematch, which we'll get into, uh, I sort of give him some ideas in terms of because I don't think he had a lot of experience playing heads up. You know, he plays high stakes, but heads up is a very different animal. And there was fundamentally some things that just gave me a pretty big advantage where I was never really at risk. And as a result, early on, like I didn't know what to expect in terms of how he would play. But early on, I saw he was limping a lot. His CBET percentage was very low. His delayed CBET was quite high. Um, so essentially, you know, with me two and a half Xing the button, that alone, I essentially decided that I was just going to overfold to any large bets rather than guess, you know, in big spots where, you know, he bets pot on river or something like that. I would just fold because I felt like he wasn't three betting, three bet like two or three times total. He was limping button. I'm two and a half Xing and CBETing, you know, two thirds of the time or something like that. So just from an aggressive perspective, like he never, he never had a lead. Right. And like he was doing things that, you know, just for example, like early on, we're 250 big blinds deep. He opens the button with 910 suited, which is a fantastic hand heads up. This is a lot of hand. And I three bet a standard amount to 10x. He makes it two and a half. This is like a, this is like you're excited to play 910 suited turn. He folded free, which is just a, just, just wrong. Right. I mean, I'm whatever, wow. just a mistake, you know? Um, and so, you know, he had his ideas about how he wanted to perch as well, but like, um, but yeah, so I, like I said, I didn't know how I was going to, you know, do it. But then once I realized like I had such a fundamental advantage that I could just grind my way probably to a win rather than have to like make a big call or run a big bluff or something like that, I could essentially kind of old school small ball with the added benefit of like, because here's the thing when you play heads up poker, right? If one guy limps all the time and you two and a half X all the time, right? And let's say they don't free bet a lot. Okay. Now when you're in position, you're playing a pot with five big blinds. In, okay. When they're in position, they're playing a pot with two big blinds. So I'm playing in position, which is advantageous, two and a half times bigger, right? Now, in order to sort of punish that, you need to be three betting more. And he wasn't, right? Um, but in addition, you know, it's okay to have a limp strat, especially as the blinds get higher and your stack size is lower. But if you're playing, you know, 100 big blinds deep or more, 
and one player is raising like two or two and a half X and you're not, it's very difficult to overcome. Like I'm talking about like a pure learn strategy. If you choose like, um, cause there are, and you know, Doug employed this against me after I won like 300 K on one Friday night, he came back that Monday. and was like, Oh shit, I'm like, well, I want to lose this match. So he came back with a, with a, with an actual limping strategy that is good. And you can create one that is GTO, right? But again, that incorporates still a decent amount of raising pre. And Eric wasn't raising it before the flop enough. Like, for example, he wasn't C-betting. I told him another game. He limped the button with 7-8 with the 8 of spades. Told it's fine because it was part of what he was doing. Came jack 6-4 with two spades. I check. That's a bet. That's a really good hand to bet for a lot of reasons. Obviously, you have the gut shot. You have eight highs. So you do, have, do not have any showdown value. You know, you might be able to hit an eight or a seven if I if I call the four. You also have a spade, which can allow you to potentially barrel on a spade turn and river. Um, and a whole bunch of good things happen for you. Instead, he just checked it back. The hand checked down the river. I won him king eight high. And I would have just folded on the flop, right? So overall, his aggression pre-flop and flop needed work. So as a result, I quickly made an adjustment saying, okay, you know, I'm not going to play any big pots with them unless I'm nutted. Just small ball 101. I look, I'm looking forward to the next stage. Like, cause so far, you know, I played Phil and I played Eric and I haven't played anybody who, like plays quote unquote correctly, you know, heads up, like the way that the game is built from a theoretical perspective in terms of, you know, the, you know, raising 80% of your buttons and then like three betting, maybe 12% from the big blind. So that might be fun. But again, it's not up to me who the next per- person is. Cause Eric is not rematching. He's not uh, challenging me again. So. I, uh, I, it's not let's a, talk about but, that. Let's talk about why you think that he's not. So, uh, 50,000, obviously, for those who don't know, um, he can rechallenge you for a hundred thousand. Um, if you, you know, he, it's his option immediately to, to challenge you for that match. And he decided not to. I think he quoted maybe scheduling conflicts or something. But for a guy who plays a lot of poker on, on stream, this is a great opportunity for him for, you know, a relatively small amount of money for the stakes that he plays at. I think I've seen him. Most of the time with a couple hundred grand, every time he's playing in the big cash game. So uh, 100,000 doesn't seem, especially for the trade-off, for the exposure that he's getting to the Maverick Nation or or whatever he's getting. And he's, you know, maybe, uh, what, seven, 60, 40 dogs. So what's he giving up, 10 grand or something like that? I was pretty surprised that he didn't come back and, and uh, go for the rematch. Thoughts on on why he didn't, Daniel? Well, I do. I know the reasons, so I'll share that. First of all, this was kind. Of, this whole thing was a bit of a mess. Because, and listen, I, Eric did nothing, you know, he, he made a mistake, but you know, it happens, right? It just, it was unfortunate that it was very costly. We were scheduled to play, I believe on the fourth, we, you know, we agreed it was in the text chain, you know, to play on the fourth. Um, and it was going to air on the eighth because that's typically what we do is we delay it. And I show up, I'm there with my lunch pack pair ready and the whole crew is there, you know, which is about a $30,000 spend to have everybody there. And you know, it's about 30 minutes and Eric's not there yet. So somebody, somebody calls him and says, where's Eric? He's not here yet. He's like, is that today? Because I'm in Seattle. Okay. So the whole production, right? You know, boom, goes down the tubes. Now we ended up playing the match the next day. He did fly out, which was great. Um, and then we were supposed to play the day that it aired, I think, uh, or the day after it aired. We we're supposed to play. And again, we have the crew and everybody set up to go. Rematch. And- You're saying you were set to play the rematch? Yes, 100%. The rematch was on. You know, I was ready to play on Tuesday. And that night, the night before, once again, sort of last minute, and again, this this is out of his, uh, this was, he had some issues internally with this business that were a priority that he needed to handle, right? It was just like, so, so it, it, and I, without going into too much detail, like he can share yeah. changes to, but he had to take care of that. But from a production standpoint, this is why it's really important. People don't realize that when you put on a poker show, like, there's it's not just you, you know, it's like, there's a whole production. There's like a lot of people that are working around the scenes. And again, I don't fold Eric, especially for the second one. Obviously the first one, that really sucks. Like it's said before he's supposed to play. But again, you know, I don't think he ever does anything like that maliciously. I have a good rapport with him. I like the guy, um, but it was unfortunate how it played out. And now it's sort of put them in a bit of a scramble because the crew is going to be moving over to the Horseshoe, Paris for the World Series of Poker like next week. So, because I was going to say, I was like, bring somebody else to me up. I'll play before the series starts, right? Because I kind of like to do that because my money's frozen now at 100K. Not that I need it, but it's frozen till the next round. But not enough time, not enough turnaround. So now we have 30 days. There will be a list of challengers. We've seen some people like from all well, from uh, from Jungle Man, Sam Soverall, I believe Ryan Garcia, the boxer. We had uh, Chris Brewer, I believe, with MJ, you know, 
So there's definitely some interest in what they'll do. You know, I have no say in this. What they'll do is they'll choose the person that they find will be the most entertaining. So these matches, especially at the 1500 level, this isn't like stare, stare at the wall, wait 25 seconds, and then open. None of that. We don't, we don't want that, right? So like, you know, imagine some of the high rollers that you watch where like it was David Peters and, Ch- you know, and like Chidwick or something. And they just stare at each other for 20 seconds and then check. You know, you can't have that. So obviously when you get to the 800K level, now you bring in a whole new clientele because not everybody play, you know, 800Ks for fun. So again, I think that the goal in the early stages of these things is, you know, fun banter, interesting dynamic, whether there's beefs or not. And then obviously as it goes up, maybe the crushers start to, you know, get more of a chance. But if you are kind of a, just a crusher who, you know, you know, has never really been all that entertaining, you probably go to the bottom of the list, just being honest. And it's not me saying that, it's that. Interesting one there is a guy, there's a guy who's been dominated in this format. Let's be honest. He's won a ton of matches in the heads up duel. I didn't hear his name. I didn't hear him yeah, say. Yeah, no. Phil Helmut's another option, right? You know, if he chose to play. The other yeah. one I thought would be kind of fun because it's kind of ridiculous. Um, Antonio lost three times to him. Yeah. I lost three times to him. We could call it the loser's bracket. So <laughs> like, dude, sort of for me and Antonio, like I could just think of the fun banter and I have some really good ideas if we did go that route of how yeah. I could build him in, in, a, in a self-deprecating kind of way. Um, but yeah, he's, you know, Antonio's a great, fun, entertaining guy. I think Jungle Man would be great too. Who knows what sort of costume he would bring. For me, I kind of like the Jungle Man idea because it's, it allows me to sort of play like I said, kind of properly against somebody who I know is going to play quote unquote properly. And I think that's, I think it's a little more interesting, frankly. Like I think heads up. And I also think the matches are likely to go faster, right? When you look at people that limp and play, you know, this kind of cautious style, like these matches like go like eight rounds. You have two players who are really playing, you know, we can be over in an hour, you know, which I think is kind of a, a good wrinkle occasionally. You know, it doesn't always have to be like a seven hour marathon. Give me somebody you don't want to play. Somebody I don't want to play? Man, I mean, I could come up with names. Probably I wouldn't want to play against uh, Ali Amshurovich. I hear he's good. <laughs> I don't want to play him. Which Ali? <laughs> you want to play all his, all, all his accounts? <laughs> right, it would if you like, played in a, a, an electromagnetic room where like there's electrical interference everywhere. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I don't think I'd want to play him. Uh, all right, so uh, let's move on. Um, there was uh, another head up, a match, a grudge match, so to speak, uh, in the poker world, and that was Matt Berkey. He was playing against uh, Nick Airball. They had a, uh, a heads up match that was supposed to last 100 hours, and uh, he'd end up lasting 60 hours of live poker. It wasn't streamed uh, or anything like that, but uh, there was some live updates uh, coming out of the Solve for Y crew. Um, and uh, Berkey ends up uh, beating him pretty quickly in 60 hours for the million dollar agreed upon stop loss. You could quit after uh, somebody was down a million. Interesting because uh, Airball was pushing for a $2 million stop loss when they started and uh, Berkey was like, no, no, a million. And then as soon as Airball got down a million, he quit. Um, and, you know, uh, it was conciliatory of defeat. He came out and said, um, you know, Matt, you played great. You deserve to win. I've got lots to learn kind of thing. So that was cool. But Geez, the drama around this thing was just eye rollingly hard to hard to follow. Like I'm sure- I want to focus on that last part because that's the real clap, clap, clap moment, right? A lot of times when you have these heads up duels and battles, in the end, it's kind of like, all right, we're warriors, let's have a beer over it. And I thought Nick Airball crushed it with his uh, what with what he wrote. I mean, it was right on point, total ownership for he explained, you know, why he was where he was at with it, you know, acknowledged that you know Berkey's a better player, apologized for some of the you know, negative things that he said about him and his company and stuff like that. So that's what you like to see. And I think we should spend more time celebrating the good and like, yeah. you know, and again, like if he even all, you know, sometimes it's like, I'm kind of obnoxious. I try to be a character. I think poker needs character, but maybe I take it a little too far, you know? So that's great. I think it's great. I mean, I was really, uh, that's how you do a concession speech, you know, instead of, he could have done the old, you know, rigged, it was, it was rigged, but he went with, you know, class. I like that. Poker needs natural characters, though. It doesn't need invented characters. It's so obvious when it's invented, right? Like, it's so obvious when they're trying too hard. And, and that's my best advice to everybody who asks me about this. I say, you have to be authentically you, right? Yeah. When you, you know, when you create a character that's not you, um, you know, it'd be so obvious to people. Now, I want to make sure that I make this clear. I'm not talking about Jungle Man. It's a very different story. 
that's all jungle. Yeah. That's what jungle is. Jungle is like a fun loving, you know, he obviously is on the spectrum. You know, he's a unique individual. He loves to embrace the idea of playing a character. You know, that's who he is. Like he plays, you know, what is it, Dan Dan Diego. He plays Macho Man. You know, he does Caesar, but he does it for fun. It's not like he's actually pretending. So it's not, so in that regard, I don't see it as inauthentic with him because that's authentically who he is, right? Like if Terrence would do that, I'd be like, oh, what? What are you doing? Like, that's not you. Come on. <laughs> no, you look back at poker's characters of the past and they're all authentic. Phil Helmuth is, that's the way he is. It's completely right. awesome. Sean Chacon, Sammy Farha. Yes, all Barry, these guys. Even the Barry Greenstein, Chris Bergson's the, whoever there, were, there was, Phil Ivey, you know, Patrick Antonius, Gus Hansen. Like they were just, and that's what I said, you know, like high stakes poker. It was fly on the wall type stuff when it was really just like that. And you saw people as they are. Now with streams and stuff, you're right. Like some people try to go, oh, I want to, you know, do something extra. That's outside my, you know, my yeah. natural character. Where back then, I was just real, like Freddie Deep yelling and screaming about being rat hole. Like you just had authentic, as authentic as fuck characters, and that's why, you know, those old high stakes poker episodes go down as, you know, sort of the pioneers of televised poker that everyone loved. Obviously, we've moved on now to like live streams and things like that. These eight hour long winded things that I'm not as much of a fan of, but I, I think uh, nothing beats those old high stakes poker episodes. Hundred percent. Uh, all right, let's go move on quickly. The uh, douchebag of the week award goes to a 70 year old dude named Dave in uh, Florida who entered a WPT ladies event and uh, thought it was a good idea. And he ended up winning the event of all things. He takes it down. Um, there was a bunch of bounties that some of the, the women and himself actually put a hundred dollar bounty on his head, but there was uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of bounties on his head. And uh, Dave the douchebag ends up taking it down, and and it's just so insane to me that people try to um, inject themselves into something like this that's so obvious for a good cause. It's so obvious that you know you're not wanted in this position. It's such a narcissistic thing to say. I'm going to go sit in a fucking women's poker tournament and try and piss everybody off. Like, fuck it. Who? What is your problem? Like, we just can't. Well, act- what this guy said. I mean, and it's a, it's a shitty defense, but I'll say it anyway. Was his defense is that he showed up for this tournament and the main event was going on, which was a 10k, and you know he he couldn't afford to play the 10k, and so he thought there was a one. He saw on the schedule that there was a 1k. The 1k was the ladies' event, or I might be getting the numbers wrong, but the much smaller buy-in was the, was the ladies' event. He decided if that's the only event I can enter, I'm going to enter it, and yeah. You know, unfortunately, there are no such th- actual things as poker gods, because obviously he would have been like one outed on the on the bubble if there were. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's that's his alleged defense. Um, I, I guess I, the one thing that the good thing that came out of it was was Bill Perkins, uh, you know, adding an overlay to a to the to the, to the event at the lodge, uh, the ladies event at the lodge, because apparently in Texas, they don't have this law where you know you're allowed to sign up um as a man in a woman's event and also let's just circumvent all this all this nonsense about oh you know you, you can say oh all the i can just identify as a woman and play shut the fuck up like you're just being a dickhead you know you're, you're not saying anything if you can be like oh what's a woman in 2023 shut the fuck up go jump off a bridge like get therapy um but bill perkins is is adding money to a tournament this guy, like Matt Savage, I think Matt Savage was the one who who grilled this guy the most um, in the WPT ladies event because, of course, Matt Savage has the association with the WPT. He made it very clear. Unfortunately, this is not their event, nor legally would they have been able to exclude him anyway. So, so for me, here's the thing: I want I agree with everything you said. Of course, um, I hate it that he was allowed to play. If I ran a tournament and there was any sort of legal way that I could, you know, preclude him from playing in the tournament, I would do that. Which brings us to the point is like, he shouldn't be allowed to do that, right? Like we we have to we have to have some kind of a rule, some kind of stipulations. Otherwise, you have these situations where, for example, you know what how used to happen in the ladies' event at the World Series of Poker, right? Where one year I think there was twenty three men who played in it, right? Because back then it was before they figured out the sort of loophole where you could charge ten k for you know for male entrance and one k for female entrance, and we had like twenty one or twenty two players who entered that, and like. From their perspective, they're like, I'm allowed to play in it. It's perceived to be a softer field, a lot more newer players and stuff like that. So why wouldn't I play, right? Because I'm, you know, I'm not an asshole, so I wouldn't play it. But point being is, 
you know, the World Series, I think, did a good job with 10K, 1K, but like we have to sort of have some rules in place, like ways in which you can- They found a loophole. Right. I mean, really. Ways in which you can identify that. And listen, I don't know the right answer, but potentially like, what does your driver's license say? You know, how long have you lived lived like as a as identified as a woman and all this kind of stuff? Because what the guy did was he exposed something in a way that is going to be problematic in a lot of different areas. Like we're gonna to have to sort of figure this out, right? Because it's all new to us. It's only been a few years. We have to figure out how to manu- how to like navigate this in the future so that we don't let this crazy stuff happen, like you know, what happened in Alberta and whatnot with the with the power lifter and, and you know, it's stuff like this will pop out with some machismo men who are like, fuck this, I'll just say I'm a woman for today and now I own all the powerlifting records in Alberta. So we have to figure out ways in which we can, you know, address this fairly for everybody. Yeah. 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 I think the the, the World Series did a great job. I don't know if you're allowed to do that because because in Nevada, the way they do it, with the, the ten thousand dollar entry for for women or for men and one thousand for men, it's just a nine thousand dollar ladies discount, which you're always allowed to do. You're allowed to go to a bar and say drinks are this much for ladies and they're this much Right. The question uh, is, right, Terrence, though, like if you went to the ladies event and said, I'm Terrence Chan, for example, I want to identify a woman as only pay the 1K, right? right. You can get away with it because I believe that they use it. They do it based on identification. I think they, and I'm not, don't quote me on this. But like I, if your government ID says it. If your government ID says male or female, yeah. but they go. Well, by. I mean, if you've gone to the effort of changing your government ID to female, then then you get to pay 1K. Totally fine. Right. But if that. you haven't, let's say, but, but so that someone did bring up this point, I believe it was a uh, transgender person who brought up this point is like in some states they can't legally do that. So if somebody right. is transgender, right, like and they're in a certain state like that, they can't legally change their right. So like again, it's a difficult thing, right? We're all learning, and I'm what I wish yeah. we could get to. That, that's a bit of a, a society problem. Like let's right. hope that in those places they can point, change that. Yeah. I wish we could get to a point where we could sort of all work together to figure this stuff out without throwing labels out just for suggesting ideas and things like that. Like genuinely work towards making everyone happy and everyone feel. Like in like they're in a safe space to play, um, you know, and that you know, no one's gaming the system, if you will, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. Speaking of the World Series of Poker, we've got uh, we've been doing um, you know vulture weeks of the World Series uh, leading up to it. Of course, we're five weeks, we're six weeks away from the World Series of Poker. No, what are you talking about? No, what are you talking about? about? Where are you? About? We're three. We are years. 19 days away from the World Series of Poker as we're recording this. Less than three weeks away. We'll we'll uh, we've run long today, so we'll cut. We got two weeks left, I think, to do. We'll do that leading up to it. But quickly, Daniel, uh, to touch on the 25k uh, fantasy league that you run every year. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be a banner year for that uh, fantasy contest, and we've changed the rules a little bit. It's going to be massive. I've gotten so much interest this year. I think the most we had was 14, and I believe I've already got 14 confirmed. I think. We're, I think we're at 16 that have shown. I think we're going to have 20, right? So there is a couple rule changes. Actually, David Baker came and said, you know, why do we do that? And it's like, yeah, you're right. So we um, we made one small change, which was in the past, events that excluded people like didn't count. So the women's event or the ladies' event, whichever we're going by these days, uh, the, com- the employees' event and the seniors' event, they used to not count, but now they do. So you know, maybe it increases the value of some old geezers. Right. And why is that? Talk about that decision because it's, it's, I would have thought you would do it, you know, much like the way the POI only includes open events that I, w- I would think that fantasy would too. What, what was the thought behind that decision? Well, it makes the less. So basically, it increases the value of some players potentially, like obviously female players, right? Like that's a little extra bonus if you do choose, a, you know, someone like a Maria Ho or a Cherish Andrews or, or, or Kristen Bicknell or Kristen Fox, and pardon me. Um, and you're sitting off Daniel, right? I think, can you play the seniors this year? Uh, I'm not, I'm not, not there yet, buddy. But okay. anyway. But yeah, we didn't realize like, what's the big deal, right? You might as well just include it. Like it doesn't, it's, there's no like, there's no, it's not, it's not the POI, right? It's, it's so this is like a totally separate thing where we're picking based on, you know, performance at the World Series. So why not make it open? I still push back against the tag team because I don't like that idea of just like, you know, someone stacking a team with somebody who's not going to play one hand, you know, pick up points. It's just a, it's just a hassle. So the only one that won't count is the tag. I think the interesting thing, you guys, tell me what you think. We'll be strategically how to approach now. What we typically see, you know, is anywhere from 12 to 14, you know, 11 to 12, 14 teams. With 20 teams now and picking 160 D, right? How would that affect your strategy in terms of how you draft? Because there's obviously a couple of ways to do it. You know, one theory is, you know, you stack with a couple of big guns and then get some $1 players to fill it out. Another strategy is sort of get some middling guys and have a balanced team. Now, with 20 
teams, do you think the values of the high-end guys go up, go down? What do you think the GTO strategy would be in terms of drafting? Uh, I think the value of the of finding a needle or a diamond in the rough goes up a, a great amount. So if you if you do have some of those and you can get deep into the weeds with players that you think are going to be really value at a dollar, at four dollars or whatever it is, then you can go spend a, a higher amount on somebody like yourself who's going to play every event, Daniel. I, I, my approach, I think, would be more of a uh, stars and scrubs sort of approach. Well, but that's already a good strategy. Right. You know, like, you know, with the current system, the, what, the issue, I guess, it gets to is like when you let's say, for example, you blow your load, you know, and you need three players and you've only got a dollar to bid and like the pickings get slimmer. You know, once you're looking at, oh, oh my God, 120 people have been chosen already. You know, I got to scratch real and really dig. But like you said, obviously, if you have there, there are just aren't that many guys who will play a full schedule. That's the that's the problem is that what I think is it's like, great about this, too, though. It's going to expand it because everybody wants to be drafted. They genuinely do like people like, oh, man, pick me. Right. This is going to expand it to now where just guys who play no limit that play like mid stakes or whatever. They're probably worth the buck or so. They didn't used to be in the past. Like if you were playing high stakes mix and all that kind of stuff, then you didn't get drafted. But now it gives like a lot more. uh sort of i think it expands the reach and i think that's a good thing i really think like yeah you use this you see the pride i think i mean listen i feel it when people get drafted they they kind of have this like prideful thing of sort of being in the you you, you even hear that at the the table the table talk when you got the team captain at the same table as one of the horses i was ah sorry you know like i've I've had a shitty series you would be shocked how often this happens let's say for example terrence i drafted you right you're going to play your whole schedule. You have no piece of my team and no financial interest. Mm-hmm. But something in you goes, I'm going to do my best to kick ass for you. Yeah. Right? It's almost like, because, you know, you showed faith in me, I'm going to win for you. I'm going to play more events. I'm going to, I'm going to just get it in. I'm going to like try to win you, you know, you, you win you your, uh, your, your pool. So that's always kind of a fun sidebar. And I think it's really good for the community. Gives us other stuff to talk about. So, for- uh, so it's a hundred. So you think 20 teams, eight players, a team, 160 players are getting drafted. That's your over under. I think it's going to be 20 teams. Yeah. That's would- wild. That's really well. Yeah, that's I can't even name 160 poker players. <laughs> They're there. You know, that's the thing. But I mean, everyone's going to have their list. What, uh, what you other... down, look, look down to the, the World Series POI last year. Who finished 160th? Let's take a look. One right? other rule change I'm making this year. Um, well, Jake and Ali are still not eligible to play. But one other rule change. It, they're not eligible to drive. One other rule change I want to make this year, because last year it's happened. It happens almost every year. Someone says, you know, $1 Chris Bitch. And everyone around her looks and goes, he tweeted he's not coming at all. So like Ryan Reese did Oops. that last year and he got stuck with him. That really feels bad. You know, it sort of takes it. And then we had this Russian guy um, who would a gypsy who did it like one year and just like it just spoils the whole fun for him, right? So what we're doing this year is I'm going to be doing my research and anyone else that does. If we know clearly somebody is not playing, we're not going to allow a loophole of somebody who's like, tell everybody not playing and then someone picks it for a dollar, they will be ineligible to be picked. So Chris Vitch, for example, based on his speed last year, he's off the board. He cannot be chosen, right? Because lastly, let's say, for example, Phil Ivey. Like, look at a scam I could play. Phil Ivey says to everyone, okay, guys, just so you know, Phil Ivey said he's not playing any terms, right? But he tells me that he's playing a full schedule. So then I pick him up. I'm like, all right, I'll take him for a buck, right? We don't want to have that. That's like extreme shadiness and whatnot. Obviously, there's the thing about this, and I, I was really surprised by this one person gave me pushback. When you have a team, let's say you're Gordo, right? Gordo has a team, right? Well, Gordo's schedule, he could play cash, high stakes cash, where he could play a full schedule, right? If he drafts himself, the value of him goes up. But if you draft him, the value mm-hmm. of him goes down. And Todd Brunson used to do this all the time. He'd be like, if anyone, if anybody bids more than five, I'm not playing a fucking tournament, right? Because he wants to have himself, right? Which I'm fine with. You know, it's, it's okay. Again, this is mostly about fun. I know it's 25000 Sounds like a lot of money, but the people partaking in this, it's really not. It's just a fun sweat on the side. And again, on the side, there is a whole bunch of side action. But everyone, all the information is available. Everyone knows what's going on. So it'll be fun. So so I should take my my seven tournaments that I'm playing on my calendar and tweet it out, hashtag 25K Fantasy, so that I can be drafted for a dollar. and I can be the 159th overall pick. You think? Do you think you'd be worth it? Uh, probably not. I don't know. Like I'm going to play like seven events. <laughs> But I mean, there, but there are small. They're all small field events. Close. Yeah, they're all they're all small field events. So I don't know. See, what's Maybe interesting I mean, is that you're even in the conversation. Now. Like you wouldn't have been. No, right. no, I definitely Why? would never be in the conversation. Of seven seven events. Like ten years ago, I might when I played like thirty, but no. Right. Yeah. And then we'll, if you double that number, if you double that number, now all of a sudden, oh boy, <laughs> you know, 
<laughs> we'll see. Maybe, I mean, maybe I just banked the first one, and then now I'm just going ham, right? Mine are just running to the player of the year. Yeah. <laughs> I remember my brother got picked one year, and I asked him, I said, are you going? He goes, no. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good fun. Uh, the World Series Boca package that you you put on uh, on the market every every year. You've done that. It's, it's sold out. Yes, it did. So basically, on PokerStake.com, if you're interested in taking pieces of people throughout the World Series, you can go there now, and you can find a whole bunch of people selling for different events, and different markups, and things like that. And you can sort of gauge for yourself what makes sense. I did my yearly World Series of Poker package. Um, put up. Uh, I think we we, we sold out. We sold twenty five percent, which is four hundred fifty thousand dollars. Uh, the over under Josh said it was like eight hours for it to sell. In three minutes, ninety percent of it was sold, and it sold in forty minutes time. Because we put a small cap on, you know, the cap was like nine hundred bucks or something, the most you could bid. Uh, but I will say this: for those that missed out, you will have an opportunity throughout the World Series. I will reserve like ten percent of some of the bigger events and post them. And you know, you could just watch the vlogs every day, and you'll know when those are coming up, and those will get posted in the mornings of you know when those events happen. But, you know, just keep your eye on uh, Poker Steak and also the logs and, and you'll have a chance to get a little piece because uh, I plan on absolutely dominating the World Series of Poker this year. Four WSOP bracelets has never been done at a World Series of Poker. And I think this year, you know, I feel like I'm supposed to do it. I've, I'm going to do the hell new things. Like, I deserve it. So I deserve <laughs> four. I'm going to take four. I don't care if it's freaking... I'm in like a 10K Raz and I win the freaking $300 double stack online, whatever. And with the Raz, like, well, I don't give a shit. If it says bracelet, I want it. Give it to me. <laughs> Any bracelet bets? Are you gonna do? I've seen a couple of uh, things out there floating on Twitter with bracelet bets. No, I'm not doing any bracelet bets. I haven't done them in about 10 years. Me and Phil Ivey used to take a bracelet bet, the two of us together at like two to one or something like that. Um, but since, you know, I haven't done that, Berkey was throwing around race to bet offers. He wanted about 35 for one. I think he's never won a live tournament in his life. You know, he was asking me and I said, you know, I think part of the biggest, the biggest question with a bet like that is right. Like, so for example, if I, if you ask teaching, like, what are the odds you want to brace it this year? Right? Well, if you bet on it, right. And you only play seven events. What if you bet a million dollars on yourself? I imagine you're going to play more than seven events. So now the odds on you winning one should, you know, drastically decrease so it's a question of how much the bet is for the bigger like for example sean d right. if john d bet 5k that he'd get the 17 percent body fat that's just 5k that's completely burned there's no chance in hell but the fact that he has a chance to win a million dollars all of a sudden you know now we have a sweat so he's down 15 pounds uh if you're not more than that i think 23 well, i think in the sorry i just watched the video where he was down uh, in the first month he was down 15 pounds if you go to YouTube, it's, I think it's called Million Dollar Deep. He's got a couple of videos up there where he tracks his progress, but he's doing awesome. It's great to see. Uh, That's it's not funny. a lot, though, you know. But I think what people don't realize too with the weight loss thing is he's doing weight loss, but he's also going to be gaining muscle. So yeah. typically, like just just I mean, Terrence can speak to this too. Like if somebody's you know obese, right, and they're just their goal is fat loss, like it's much easier to do if you just do cardio, for example. But you know he's trying to get to a body composition. So even though the weight loss number isn't that drastic, it's 15 pounds you would assume for someone with 300 pounds. It, that's not, it doesn't sound all that big of a deal. But the fact is, he's also weight training and stuff. So, so some of that fat is being transferred into muscle, which he's right. going to need. He's going to have to have need muscle mass in order to get... It's not enough to just lose fat. He also has to build muscle. So even though it doesn't sound... Because like to me, 15 pounds at that size, what, is that really a lot? Yeah, you know, it's not. I used to I used to know a guy who who did DEXA scans. Like this was his job for a living. He says like the guys, the guy the guys who are the lowest body fat runners. You think they'd be mar everybody thinks who's got the lowest body fat marathoners? No, no, it's bodybuilders. It's bodybuilders because they're like two hundred pounds and they got like no body fat on them because they have so much muscle that what body fat they have on them doesn't. Yeah, like uh, when you think about the word percentage, right? Yeah. It's the percentage of your body weight, right? If you have no muscle, that percentage is zero. It's so you would, you know, you need to increase it, which, uh, which seems like, you know, he understands. And that's why I said 15 pounds. It does it like, again, that sound, that would sound to me like it's, it's behind schedule if the goal was weight loss, but it's not. The goal is body fat percent. Well, we're, we're talking about that. I was thinking about how he does he the, Sorry. I what, just want to quickly say, I'm looking forward to how he does in the world series this year, because, um, being a killer of deficit and playing, you know, 12, 14 hour, days playing poker and he you know was playing every turn uh, even if he just breaks even on calories for six weeks eight weeks what, what difference no no i'm telling you what 
I genuinely believe I will not have him on my fantasy team this year. Yeah, I don't like his chances. Because, like, for me, even for me, which I'm not a big guy, right? During the World Series, I gain 10 pounds because I stress eat. I don't get as much sleep. Plenty of studies show when you don't get enough sleep, you crave sugar, you crave carbs, and you want them often, right? He's the guy who typically, you know, is fueled, but you know, he's playing multiple tournaments and he's constantly fueled by whatever carbs, he, you know, he takes in, right? Now, if he does stay on track, you know, the idea of him waking up at 9 a.m., having a protein smoothie and going to the gym and then playing the tournaments, it's going to be a lot, you know, a lot of his advantage. And I've always been impressed with Sean's ability, you know, to play like really long hours and still be sharp. Like it's, I'm like, oh, I was like, man, he's like, it's like two in the morning and he's still on, he's still paying attention. He's going to see, I don't know how much of a little, he's going to see a drop off, right? There's just no way, right? You know, you're, when you're, when you're playing poker, you're burning a lot of calories. Your brain needs the fuel. It wants the fuel. Same with chess. You know, they talk and specifically carbohydrates, fast carbohydrates. Yes, which are which are not good for weight loss. But um, yeah, I mean, I think I think there will be a performance drop. I I think it's probably overstated. I would bet that whatever Sean goes up at the draft probably be, uh, I I would bet his performance will actually be better than than the expected drop. I think I think the the expected drop I think is more than. Uh, I, th- I think you're exaggerating the expected drop, but I do think well, we don't know. Drop. I'm not sort of in the. I'm, yeah. I'm saying there will be a drop. I don't know how big it will be, and it'll depend on you know where he's. I think at. it'll be small. I think he'll be able to do it because all he has to do. Is, I think. I think calorically, if he just breaks even for the eight weeks, I think that's a win. I'll tell I you also, what. I also I'll think learn. he's not going to do that. I also think he's going to have a big back. I think he's just right. knowing Sean yeah. that he's, he's. No, I think he's good. Like you know, he's not good worth that work ethic, and he's going to be on. But I'll tell yeah. you what, like. As you get leaner, I don't know if Terrence has ever experienced this himself, but like when I did that thing where I went from like 176 to 138, when I got down there, like, and I'd lay on the couch and get up, I'd stand up and I'd have like vertigo. Like I would mm-hmm. literally be like dizzy for a moment. I'm like, what's this? Right. And it was just like being depleted, right? You know, it's like energy, carbs, whatever the case may be. Um, so who knows? Like, you know, mentally and physically, uh, he's never done this before. So it's, it's, we don't have a sort of template in terms of how it's going to affect him. But it's a lot to take on. Don't forget too, like you know, during the World Series, you know, generally, usually, all he does is play poker. Boom, 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 boom. And now he's got more to think about. Like it sounds like he's got his food prep, and he's got all that ironed out, and that's going to be great. But you know, the idea of actually still going to the gym when you just played till one in the morning, it's going to be tough. Yeah, agreed. Uh, just quickly, uh, we did have a little bit of an NHL first round uh, contest last show. Um, the two guys who follow. Aki, the closest, went a combined three for 16, so that wasn't good. Uh, it was a tough first round. It was an interesting first round. I love the first round of the playoffs, and it didn't disappoint. Three for 16? You mean three for eight, right? <laughs> that's, that's pretty no, bad. You went one for eight. I went two for eight. That's three oh, for okay. nine. Combined yeah, three for 16. Yeah. Yeah. good. Yeah. Um, I mean, we all, I mean, if you were a hockey insider, like you would know, you would know that Seattle would have pulled it off. I mean, yeah, I am minutes. lucky that every one, both of my big fantasy drafts I did, I stacked Seattle players. No, you did. I was in both of them too. And I saw it. I was like, what the fuck is he doing? And then, you know, bake. But uh, I made a huge mistake. That's going to cost me the 400. I just know it. I was doing laundry. I was whatever. I picked the wrong goal. I was like, good. Take the Seattle goalie, Philip Grubauer. I saw him more. Martin Jones, click Martin Jones, went, oh, shit, he's got to third. So I get no points for all the wins that Seattle's had throughout the playoffs. So it's Terrence, only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Rich is the best. Uh, Terrence takes uh, takes down the contest. We all owe you 100 bucks. T went four for eight, and uh, Roscoe went three for eight. So uh, a lot of fun there. That was good. Um, and, hey, so we were talking about Twitter spaces earlier. Do you think we could do... The Dap Poker Podcast on Twitter Space. Do you think that would work? Of course. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Ross is a technical guy. He's going to have to record it, but I don't see any reason why we couldn't. Why the we stuff we couldn't do is screen share, but probably. Well, I mean, but... we can do it two ways, guys. We can do it two ways. We can simply, you know, we can just not do the video version, right? We, we can do the video version and the Twitter Space. Or what we can do is we could just do an audio version where, you know, we're all on there. We can do whatever we're doing. We, you know, or we're the hosts, and then we can bring people in and out. Um, and then we can always share that on YouTube as well when it's done. That'd be a lot of fun. I think I think people who listen to the show might be interested in doing it that way. They get to contribute a little bit during the show, and we can uh, we can check it out. When we do the Maybe next, Maybe let's look at rough. You know, not they're not not locked in, but I'd like to. We can announce it. Is maybe yep. it's coming Tuesday. Maybe okay. we'd say something like 5 p.m. Pacific. I'll set a reminder, put it out there. We'll call it the Dat Poker Podcast. People can call in. 
and then we'll just test do a test run. Maybe we can go for a few hours. And if and the cool thing about space is if you've got to go, no big deal. We can you know we can keep on rolling and uh, you can pop in and out um, as you have time. That'd be yeah. awesome. Let's do that. So look for Daniel's uh, look to Daniel's Twitter for the announcement of when we're gonna have the uh, the Death Booker Podcast Twitter Space. We'll do that. Uh, next time to give it a test drive and uh that's going to be it for this week thanks to everybody for for getting together and thanks to you out there for listening we will talk to you soon